Hey, good morning, church family. I am so excited that you're here today on this special day. We wanna welcome all of our Concord friends who are with us, not only in the choir, uh, leading us uh, today in worship, but in our congregation and all of our guests. We're so thrilled that you're here today on this uh, historic day. I'm down at Concord Church. It's my privilege to be there to preach along with our choir and our orchestra and other members who come to join us there at Concord. You know, this is our fourth year. We've had a great partnership with Concord Church, but you also know this is not a singular event that we simply swap pulpits. Uh, Pastor Carter and I have been able to speak into uh, racial reconciliation issues within our city and really nationally, as we've been a part of national conversations in New York City, Charleston, Charlotte, all around the nation. And Dallas has really become uh, a story of God at work and what happens when we simply reach across racial lines. I respect Pastor Carter as a pastor, as a leader, as a brother, as a father and a friend, as much as anybody I know. I praise God for him, his influence in my life, in my family's life. He and Stephanie, Stacy and I have come together. We love their family, love them so much and love his church family. And I praise the Lord that he's with us and I know that you'll be praying for him as he comes to bring the word of God for us today. So if you'll give a big Park City's welcome to Pastor Brian Carter. so very much. God bless you. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so incredibly much for your kind and warm welcome. It brings us great joy as we celebrate this fourth year together of two churches coming together, different parts of town, but understanding the importance and the role that Christians play in this whole matter of racial reconciliation. In a day and time where there is so much incredible division, today is really about a day of unity a day of coming together, representing one church in Dallas. Now, all of us understand that we live in two parts of, of the city, some in north and us in the southern part of Dallas. We have different backgrounds, but we also understand that which joins us together is much greater than that which separates us. And that is because we all believe in the same God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Jesus Christ, and that is the thing that makes the most difference. So it's our joy, and we say thank you. Thank you for this four-year journey uh, where God has continued to connect our hearts over these, these seasons as we have worshiped. Uh, Pastor Jeff is my great friend and my great brother, and I'm just thankful for him, thankful for his leadership in our city, thankful for his boldness in addressing a topic that is often overlooked. Uh, but he's done it with so much grace and so much courage, and you are blessed. Help me to celebrate Pastor Jeff, even in his absence. Let's praise God for him. Amen. He is a tremendous man of God, and I am incredibly thankful that God connected our hearts and our lives some five years ago, and, uh, and God has continued to nurture that relationship. I thank God for him, his lovely wife, Stacy. There are three amazing children and all that God is doing through their lives. And so I'm grateful, of course, to our music ministry for coming every year, helping to celebrate them. Minister Gay and our men's choir came this year, and they have done a great job. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, so much. And so I am uh, See, some of our church members are here, some of our staff, and we are grateful uh, to be with you, and we are overjoyed with my wife and our kids, and it's always a joy to be together. We look forward to this time each and every year. I, I want us to consider a passage of Scripture today uh, that I hope both challenges us and reminds us of the great calling that sits upon the life of every single one of us as believers in Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. I want to read that verse for you and then focus our attention there. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9. Reading from the NIV, it reads this way. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Once more, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. For a few moments, I want to talk about being a peacemaker. 
being, being a peacemaker. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God. We thank you so much for this day that not only as we connect, other churches are swapping and exchanging pulpits to send a message to both the community, to our city, and to others that we believe that we can come together through our Christian faith. So, Father, we thank you for this relationship that is nurtured over time, and we thank you, Lord, even now as we look into your scriptures, that your scriptures may speak to our hearts and minds in a fresh way. We pray for Pastor Jeff as you use him in a special way there, and we pray for our services here as well. It's in your son, Jesus' name, that we do pray. Amen. 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 Being a peacemaker. We live in a world where division is becoming more and more prevalent. The brokenness of our society and our culture is ever before us. We're divided politically, Republican, Democrat, Independent. We're divided economically as we quickly watch the middle class vanish before our very eyes and the wealth gap continuing to grow wider and wider. We're divided geographically. North Dallas is predominantly white, and Southern Dallas is predominantly black and brown. We are divided racially in Dallas. 29% are white, 24% black, 41% Hispanic, 24% foreign-born. And these racial divisions and tensions of today continue to show up more and more. It was just last season in the NFL where several players kneel during the national anthem to protest uh, racism in America. It was just last year when an NFL Houston Texans owner made a comment, we can't have the inmates running the prison. It, it was just last August when in Charlottesville, Virginia, a white nationalist rally was taking place and someone slammed their car into a counter protest. One person was killed and 19 were injured. And the president makes a statement, there are fine, very fine people on both sides. It was just last September that just six months ago, the city of Dallas made the decision following a national trend uh, to begin to remove some of the Confederate statues in Dallas. The city leaders tell us that they never know so much vicious comments from citizens as they were displeased with this decision to remove these symbols that represented a bad past in our country. And we're just two years removed from the ambush of five Dallas police officers doing a peaceful, nonviolent uh, Black Lives Matter march. And in a few weeks, on April the 4th, many are gathering in Memphis, Tennessee to remember the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The conflict and the brokenness of our world is a present reality that cannot be ignored. That's why today is so very important that 20 churches would make a decision to exchange pulpits and send a message both to the city and the community that racism is wrong, and that we must make every effort to eliminate and build a co cohesive community. The racial tensions that remain are part of the lives that plague us, but the good news of the gospel is despite the brokenness that we see on TV or the brokenness that we see in the newspapers or the brokenness that we see in our communities, that there is a hope that's found in Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 says it this way, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, that sermon, he would deliver five discourses in the book of Matthew. Five sermons he would share, but it's this sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, that would be the crown jewel of all of his sermons. And it's here in this sermon that some would call, uh, they would call the, the, very, the very theme and constitution, the very framework of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. It was this sermon on the Mount that would describe not so much what a Christian was to do, but more importantly, what a Christian was to be. That's why it's called the Beatitudes, because the ideals and principles that are taught in this Sermon on the Mount are to be internalized and lived out by every single follower of Christ. It was here in the sermon that Jesus would, would lay out for every follower what it means to follow after him. And so he puts it this way in verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Let me give you a definition for what a peacemaker is. A peacemaker is one that promotes peace 
in their life and in their community. It's a peacemaker. It's a person that promotes peace both in their life and in their community. I mean, think of all the ways that Jesus could describe his followers. Think of all the commands, all the expectations that he could give to them. And yet here he does, early on, he says, I, I call you to be peacemakers. He pulls together this word peace, which is irene in the Greek, shalom in the Hebrew, and he says a peacemaker, which now makes peace an active process that to be pursued by the followers of Jesus Christ. He says, bless are the peacemakers, because they will be called the sons of God, the children of God. Because when you and I are busy making peace, we are emulating Christ, we are emulating God, and we become just like God. He says, I call you to be peacemakers. I, I, I commission you to be peacemakers. He will bring up the subject of peacemaking in verse 9, but if you read the rest of the sermon, you will see the application of making peace throughout the rest of the sermon. As he talks about forgiveness, as he talks about how to love your enemies, as he talks about how to treat those that do you wrong, all he's doing in the rest of the sermon is unpacking what it means to be a peacemaker. And I don't know if you recognize it or not, but truly, we need more peace in our world, in our communities, in our society. And I came by to tell you, friends, that, that we can't depend on legislators or someone else to teach peace. We can't depend on schools to teach peace. We, we can't depend on corporate America to teach peace. We, we cannot depend on someone else. The only one that can really teach peace to our world and to our community are the people that know the Prince of Peace. Because when you know the Prince of Peace, it qualifies you to be a peacemaker. And that's the calling upon your life and the call upon my life is to be a peacemaker. The broken relationships in your family, the broken relationships in our communities, the division in our communities, the division in our world will not be passed, will not be solved with legislation alone, will not be solved by just dealing with it from an economic front. It will be solved by the people of God being the peacemakers that God has called us to be. And Jesus says, I'll call you. Blessed are the peacemakers. The reason that Jesus can commission us to be peacemakers is because he is the ultimate peacemaker. I mean, it, it will only be late worked out later in the life of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is so profound he can speak to something now, although it won't really occur until later. You and I understand that since Genesis chapter 3, there's been a great conflict between man and God. That when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, he created a, a, a break in the relationship between man and God. And, and that break was so wide that every man and woman born was born into sin, born as enemies to God, born in conflict with God. But the grace of God is so amazing that God realized that no one else could take on the, the role of being peacemaker except himself. And so God, through his son Jesus Christ, put on the robe of human flesh, came and was born of a virgin Mary. And there he lived a sinless life until finally he then went to a cross. And on Easter Sunday, a couple of weeks from now, we will celebrate that the peacemaker came in human flesh, died on a cross on Friday, was buried, but three days later he rose from the dead as a peacemaker so that you and I can have peace with God. You understand that the reason we can be peacemakers is because God made peace with us. We, we didn't deserve it. We didn't, we didn't earn it. It was not our righteous acts. It was not the family we were born into. It was not our ability to pay tithes. It was not our church membership. No, no, no. God in himself showed grace to us, forgave us in our own sinfulness, sent his son as a sacrifice to be the propitiation for our sin, to pay the penalty for our sins. 
He died for our sins and in our place, he paid the price so that we can have now peace with God. That's what Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, that, that, that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And because we have peace with God, now we can have peace with others. He says you have a calling on your life, that, that, that you now bear the title peacemaker. I, I know you have a business card that has a title beneath it, or perhaps you went to an educational institution, or perhaps you have a certain family name, but I came by to tell you that whatever other titles may be on your name, there's a title of peacemaker that's attached to your name. Because God has made peace with you, you now must make peace with others. See, some of us misinterpret the idea of being a peacemaker. A peacemaker is not a pleaser. Some of us say, well, a peacemaker means that you just let people walk over you or you just, you just go along to get along or you just kind of let every, you ignore anything and everything. That, that's, not, that's not peacemaking. Peace, peacemaking, that's not peacemaking. That's, that's peace faking. That's peace faking. That, that, that's, that's when you ignore the conflict or ignore the issue or pretend something never happened. That's that husband that says, I said I'm sorry. Isn't that enough? He, he doesn't get it. He's peace faking. He doesn't understand that, that, that peacemaking is much different than peace faking. It's not ignoring an issue. It's not pretending something never happened. It, it's not ignoring the racial tensions that exist. It, it's, it's, that's, that's not, that's not, that's not, being a peacemaker is not being a pleaser, but at the same time, being a peacemaker is not a provoker either. So, on one side, it's not a pleaser. On the other side, it's not a provoker because peacemaking is also not viewing everybody as your enemy. You know, peace, peacemaking is not saying that everybody's against me, everybody has done wrong, or judging one person uh, by the skin of their color, or judging a whole group of people by the acts of one person. That, that's, that's not peacemaking. That's really peace breaking. Because what you end up doing is end up judging everybody as an enemy, and you really don't get peace because you're really focused on your own agenda. And so being a peacemaker is not being a pleaser, it's not being a promoter. What, what is it? A peacemaker is imitating the work of Christ. That's what a peacemaker does. They, 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 they imitate the work of Christ. They, they, they recognize that, that, that no matter what the conflict is, that the goal of the conflict is for God to be glorified by the conflict being resolved. They're, they're working to find common ground. They're, they're, they're sacrificing their own views and issues. They're recognizing their own biases. They, they, they are willing to own their own mistakes. They, they look at the model of Christ and his sacrifices, and they say, I'm willing to become uncomfortable if it means me honoring Christ in a greater way. It was in December of 1955, Rosa Parks had already sat down on a bus and by her sitting down, she would launch the Montgomery bus boycott. And there, they would organize what was entitled the Montgomery Improvement Association there at Dexter Avenue Church, where a young preacher, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., would slowly become the leader of that movement. That, that boycott would be incredibly taxing upon the community as they had to organize ways to, to get to their locations and work and other places without using the bus. It, they grew weary in this, but they knew they had to make a statement that segregation and discrimination was wrong. On one Monday night, January the 10th, 1956, the, the, the King, the church, Montgomery First Baptist Church, they were having a meeting to support the bus boycott, and Dr. King was there scheduled to speak. The church was packed. Close to 2,000 people were in that church. Full house, full pews, stairways full, walls full, every seat full. And they had there that night, and Dr. King, 26 years old, was up speaking. He was up speaking. His family was at home. And while he was up speaking, he, he began to notice that Reverend uh, Dr. Ralph Abernathy kept getting these notes while he was speaking. They didn't tell him anything. He kept speaking. And then at a moment later, he said, wait a minute. He said, he said what's, what's going on? 
leaned over to find out what's happening, and they immediately said to him, your house has been bombed. He immediately began to bring some type of closure to what they were saying, and then he said, let me make my way home. He then, upon arriving into his house, he then discovered in the home there were several people, his family and daughter and his wife were okay. His, they were also in that home was, was Clyde Sellers, the police commissioner, who had publicly joined the White Citizens Council prior to uh, and effectively had connected the police department with the Klan altogether. And not only that, but then on top of that, he, 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 Clyde Sellers then says to Dr. King, can you go outside and calm the crowd down? People are outside. They got clubs in their hands. They're upset. They're hostile. Dr. King says, you want me to go outside and calm down the crowd? Dr. King has to face a delicate moment here. And he steps out to his house. The front porch has been blown away. And he makes this statement. Don't get panicky. Don't do anything panicky. Don't get your weapons. If you have weapons, take them home. He who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. Remember, that is what Jesus said. We are not advocating violence. We want to love our enemies. And I want you to love our enemies. Be good to them. This is what we must live by. We must meet hate with love. And this 26-year-old young pastor makes this incredible statement to the point where things could have went either way. There's this misconception that being a peacemaker means you're a pleaser, or being a peacemaker means you're a provoker. But the truth of the matter is that somewhere in between, being a peacemaker means making peace your ultimate goal despite what others may try to influence you to do. I want to spend my remaining part of my time to try to help us to get a, continue to get a picture of what this peace, peacemaker means. A, a peacemaker acknowledges the sin of racism. A peacemaker acknowledges the sin of racism. Here in this work of racial reconciliation that we've been involved in together for the past four to five years, let me commend you, Park City, as a church family, for being willing to talk about a, a delicate issue. One of the problems our culture has is that we like to just close our eyes and pretend everything's okay. And then when things happen in the news or in the media, we seem to act shocked like things shouldn't be as though they are. And I'm not saying that, that, that we shouldn't be further along, and I'm not saying we haven't made progress. But what I am saying is this, that a peacemaker has to be willing to acknowledge that a country built on racism still has racism in its bloodstream, that we have made progress and we are incredibly grateful for the progress, but we also must understand that we still have a long way to go. We're, we're, we're thankful that some things and some barriers have been torn down. But we also must understand when a country has 350, for 350 years of our nation, from 1619 all the way up to the 1950s and 60s, for 350 years, a person of color was treated as physical property. We couldn't vote, couldn't live in certain parts of town, couldn't, couldn't drive in certain places. When you realize that for 350 years, that was the story that law supported it, that we were redlined out of parts, that we, that we had to live in fear with being in certain parts of town. And then for the last 50 years, in comparison to that 350, we're, we're now trying to move some ways and make ground. Then we have to understand that, that if 350 years is part of the story, you doesn't overcome that overnight. That when you begin to realize that for some of us, our grandparents, we're just one generation removed from segregation, one generation removed where some had to sit in the back of the bus, then we must understand there is still more work for us to do. When we understand that one of the reasons and tensions that, that, that people of color have so much tension with law enforcement, that for 350 years, law enforcement was the enforcers of racism. And so because of that tension, it's hard to overcome stuff overnight. 
So we must understand that the, that the racist history of our nation, we may not have chosen it, but it's part of our story. And because it's part of our story, part of, part of racial reconciliation means owning my past, owning the sinfulness of this nation, and understanding that, that how we have treated people of color, not only in our nation, even in Dallas, is part of our sto story. And we must acknowledge that racism still exists. It may not look like it once looked before, but it still exists. It still exists in, in companies that, that, that have to be forced to try to be inclusive. It, it still exists when college campuses still have difficulty making diversity the goal that it ought to be. It, it, it still exists. And because it still exists, it means that every person in this room has the role and the responsibility to try to be a peacemaker wherever God places me. I can't ignore it. I've got to know that it's still there. I've got to acknowledge the sinful and racial past that is there. I, uh, last spring break, we, we took our kids on a uh, civil rights tour. Our kids are uh, 10, 13, 15. We took them on a civil rights tour, and so we, we drove, left Dallas, and drove to, uh, to Little Rock, Arkansas, and there went to the, the school, the Little Rock Nine, where they walked in and trying to teach our, our children their, their history, trying to help them understand that it was just 50 years ago when they began to integrate schools, that where we weren't, we, had, we were forced to go to certain schools, and that some communities, and we began to talk, then we went from, we drove, we left Little Rock, and then we made our way to, to Memphis, Tennessee, and there in Memphis, we begin to walk through that beautiful civil rights museum, begin to there learn more about the story of Dr. King, begin to sit and look into that room there at the Lorraine Motel, because we wanted them to understand this story and the sacrifices that they had to make for them to have the opportunities that they have today. And then we left Little Rock, went to Memphis, and then from Memphis, went, drove then to Birmingham, and then made it to Birmingham and went to that that church, saw the park where that riot happened, saw the church where those four little girls were bombed on that Sunday morning while they were in Sunday school, and trying to help them to understand us, the story of our nation. And we, all of us, must understand the story of our community, the story of our nation. We can't just pretend that it didn't happen. We must be very aware of it, acknowledge it, and own it if we are able to move forward to where God wants us to be. A peacemaker, he acknowledges that. Here's the next one. A peacemaker advocates for racial healing. Yeah, it advocates, advocates for racial healing. Uh, Pastor Jeff, in your congregation, you, you, you understand this because you've been, you've been engaged in this work of racial healing. And I want you to understand that this is the work that God has called us to. This work of being a, 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 a peacemaker. Pastor Jeff and I had no idea that when we sat down for lunch five years ago, when we sat down for lunch and began to have a conversation around what happens at that time, it was Trayvon Martin in 2012, Ferguson in 2014, and we began to ask the question, okay, what happens when this comes to Dallas? What, what, what happens? What, what happens? How do we as Dallas begin to do work in our relationships now? for these issues that are just beneath the surface. As the book, The Hole in Our Gospel by Richard Stearns says it this way, he says, basically, it is that being a follower of Jesus Christ requires much more than just having a personal and transforming relationship with God. It also entails a public and transforming relationship with the world. If your personal faith in Christ has no positive outward expression, then your faith and mine has a hole in it. He says it this way. He says, in other words, you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. He quotes James chapter 2, verse 18. and says, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. In other words, make your faith public. If more than three-fourths of Americans call themselves Christians, yet the world has not been changed by us, Perhaps there's something wrong with our faith. Friends, this issue of racial reconciliation, I believe, sets at the feet of the Christian church. 
It sits right in our laps every Sunday morning. It sits right in our laps every Monday morning. Because I just believe there is no one else that is qualified to deal with these dynamics and these issues like the church is. See, peacemaking is intentional. It's not some passive process where we say someone else will take care of it, someone else will deal with it. No, it's Christians being active peacemakers. It's Christians being engaged. I mean, Jesus didn't just sit in heaven and say, well, somebody else will take care of their salvation. It'll be okay. No, no, no. It was Jesus Christ that said, no, I accept responsibility for this. And he intentionally at the right time took upon himself the role of being this peacemaker. One, one, one pastor I spoke to, as we began, it began with me and Pastor Jeff talking, and then the next step was Pastor Jeff said, I'll bring uh, five to six white pastors, you bring five to six black pastors, and let's just have lunch for the next few weeks. And so that's where we started. We started having lunch. We started having lunch and having conversations about what are you, what are you seeing in the media? What do you think about this? Do you ever talk about it at your church? Do you, how, how are you dealing with this? As we begin to watch it, if we begin to read, those round tables became safe places. We could wrestle with someone saying, hey, I, I never talk about it at my church. Someone else saying, I talked about it once and my members got upset. Or someone else saying, uh, That's, I, I don't know if you ought to bring that in to the church. And someone else saying, well, I talk about it regularly. But it was in these kind of conversations that if we wrestle with our own personal views and then we begin to then look to Scripture, that we begin to realize that there's some stuff we cannot talk about. You know, the world is watching the church. And the world wants to know, does the church only serve God when it's convenient? Or does the church really believe in being bold enough to honor God even when it means being uncomfortable. Peacemaking is intentional. It means you must be, you and I must be intentionally pursuing relationships with people different than us, pursuing business relationships with people different than us, pursuing friendship with those different than us. It means I must intentionally take steps to, to help my children to have a mindset of loving everyone and valuing everyone. It means that I don't view racial reconciliation like a charity case, but I view it as a life that's patterned after the life of Jesus Christ. If there was ever someone that modeled this kind of peacemaking life, it was Jesus Christ. Whether he was connecting with the Samaritan woman who many never, never acknowledge or connecting with a tax collector or connecting with others, he had a heart for connecting with others that were different from him. Peacemaking is intentional, but not only that, Peacemaking is also courageous. It takes courage to have some conversations. It, it takes courage to be able to own some of my past mistakes. It takes courage to acknowledge our own biases that we may carry. It takes courage to acknowledge privilege as influence in my life. We, Pastor Jeff and I were there in Charleston, South Carolina. There were those nine members were killed there in Emmanuel AME Church. And there, while we were gathering there, one of the victim's relatives, a sister, was there. The sister got up to, to give her testimony about just how she's wrestled with the pain of watching one of her loved ones be gunned down by Dylan Roof in that church on a Wednesday night. And while there, while saying those words, as she began to tell her story, she began to say to her, say to us that she said, I've always been taught forgiveness. She said, there were nine of us in our family, and our parents had a habit that whenever we got mad at each other or got in a fight, they would then take the two that were fighting, put them on the front porch, put them in rocking chairs facing each other, and make them sit there until they worked through whatever their difference was. <laughs> she said, we'd sit on that front porch, and then finally when we'd work through it, we'd have to apologize, forgive each other, and then come talk to mom and dad about our decision." So she said that when Dylan Roof took her, her loved one's life, she said, I didn't have any other choice but to forgive him. She said, because that's what Christians do. She said, my life has always been shaped by this reality that I have to be forgiving. I have to be acknowledging others. 
Friends, I want you to understand that it takes courage to be a peacemaker. It takes courage to reach outside your comfort zone. It takes courage to, to connect with others that may be different than us. It takes courage to have conversations that may make us uncomfortable. But this is the life to which God has called us to. Peacemaking, it, 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 it's courageous, but peacemaking can be uncomfortable sometimes. It can be uncomfortable talking about race sometimes. And so we, 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 I remember when we had our men gathered together, as our men were gathered together one Saturday morning in your great hall, and our men were, we tried to, to break the groups up, and at one table, uh, two men, we invited everyone to tell your racial story. You know, what, what's your story? Like, how, how have you, for good or for bad, what's your story? What were you taught at home? Kind of what was your story as you grew up, or matured in life? What's your story to get you where you are today? It's a great exercise because it allows us each to kind of process it, through our own lens that we have. And it just so happened at this particular table, two, two men ended up there that had both gone to uh, SMU during the 1970s. One African-American and one white. And the white guy, he goes first, and he tells a story about his experience. Then the black brother goes, and he tells a different experience as he's wrestling with being included, wrestling with isolation. And here they are, both at the same school, same campus, totally different experiences. And it was unique because you saw them connect and you saw them gain. It was uncomfortable, but it allowed them to understand each other better. It allowed them to be able to, to, to catch the heartbeat. It allowed them to be empathetic to one another. This is what peacemaking looks like. It looks like these kinds of conversations. It looks like these kinds of, of opportunities that God wants us to pursue. Here's the truth of the matter. In these past four years where we've been engaged in this work, whether we've been in conversations with the chief of police that's come and talked to our pastors or, or whether it's been the DISD superintendent that's come to talk to our pastors, they each all agree with this. They each all say there's work to be done. They each all acknowledge that no matter what the space or sphere in our city may be, they each come to this place and say, listen, we need your help. They are saying to us, to the church, we need more peacemakers. We need more peacemakers wherever God has placed you. To use your influence to leverage that to create a place where all people are valued and celebrated. To raise up our children where they love and appreciate and value us regardless of the color of our skin. So that economic opportunity is not just limited to a few, but we're always trying to find ways to elevate and engage others as well. In a couple of weeks, our churches are gathering together to start a legal clinic in southern Dallas. And so it will be attorneys from Park City's attorneys from other churches up north, up south, up north and attorneys from southern Dallas. And together, we will begin launching a legal clinic to help serve some of the needs. That's what peacemaking looks like. When you use the skills that God has you, given you, but you use it now working together. I'm so thankful for Miss Marie Jones, who is leading this, Attorney Marie Jones, who is leading this effort and helping us to bridge these gaps. It's us serving together in the city as we go and take on other service projects that are listed in the city. This is what it looks, this is what peacemaking is. And it's not just the church, it's you one-on-one -on -one finding ways to engage in this work. I close by telling you the story of a man by the name of Alfred Noble. His name was Alfred Noble, he's a Swedish physicist. He created dynamite. His intention when he created dynamite was that he wanted to use it as an explosive to move rocks and to build roads and to get out, move things out of the way so they could build buildings. And he did something, and he was fortunate enough to create such a powerful tool that could be used to, to, to move things out the way so that he can turn, could build buildings, build bridges. That was his plan. In 1888, while he lived in France, his brother died. And when his brother died, a French newspaper erroneously published Alfred's uh, obituary instead of his brother's. And they condemned Alfred 
as the inventor of dynamite. They said that he had created something that was destroying people. They were using it as an explosive in wars. And he was so brokenhearted that this is how his legacy would be remembered, that he chose to use the rest of his life to change that story. So he took $9 million, put it into account, and he began to promote peace. Matter of fact, he would call it, we call it the Nobel Peace Prize. He, he was so determined that his legacy would not be about that which was destroyed, but that his legacy would be built on the peace that was created. And so he used the rest of his life and used anything that was accomplished to create this Nobel Peace Prize that would be given out in physics and in chemistry and in medicine and literature and for anything that promoted peace. And friends, that's really the question that you and I have to consider for our own lives. What kind of legacy do you want to live? Do you want a legacy that's known simply for the things that you accomplished or the, the attainments that you had or the stuff you were acquired? But I tell you, the best legacy you can ever have is to have a legacy that's built on the fact that you were a peacemaker, that your life was not just about your own accomplishment, that your life was about following up the Christ with all that you had and being the peacemaker that he modeled for us today. It's your choice and my choice. It's our opportunity to live a life that honors him and to be a peacemaker as only, as only he can call us toward. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the challenge of your word and the challenge of your scriptures that speak to us in so many ways. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the fact that we can celebrate our peace that we have with you. The peace that we have with you was not something that we deserved, but was something that through your grace you granted toward us. So, Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus and say, Lord, help us to be peacemakers. Help us to be men and women that pursue you with all that we have. Help us to pursue peace in our homes, peace in our relationships, peace in our communities, peace in our churches. Help us, God, to be peacemakers. We love you and we honor you in every way. It's in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. And the people of God said, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.